Welcome. This is Public Eye. My name is Fumi, and it's a pleasure to spend the next hour with you. Now, today we are going to be talking about oil and Nigeria. It would appear that you cannot talk about Nigeria without talking about oil, because just before independence, Nigeria discovered oil, and everybody celebrated because a young, newly independent post-colonial country now had the resources to develop herself and become one of the most powerful nations in the world. Yay! Did this happen? Well, we are here today. It would appear that soon after that, Nigeria abandoned many, many, many of the other resources that could have helped to continue the process of development. Did we also use the oil properly? That's a full conversation to have. A new generation has to answer the question about how will Nigeria truly diversify from oil? There's been a lot of talk about Nigeria diversifying from oil for decades and decades. Right now, 80% of the country's revenue is from oil. Oil itself is becoming slightly obsolete. What will the future hold? This is a country that has resources, agricultural, solid minerals, human, so on and so forth, many of which are still not properly utilized. How do we go from talking about it to actually doing it? Because Nigeria's most pressing challenge for the future is how to pull millions of people out of poverty. I do think that we can do it. Perhaps the generation to do it is now. And so how will that happen? Well, that's what we're going to find out in the next hour. But first, we'll go on this break. Nigeria is one of the largest oil producers in Africa. And oil exports are the main contributor to the country's economy. I think the oil dependency started, I'm not sure the exact time, probably like 1970s, that era. And um, I, I think maybe probably the disaster at that time saw it as easy money. I mean, drill the oil out of the ground, sell it. And so it has continued up to now. And that's why, I mean, we did try to see the oil as easy money. And that's why we are so dependent on it. So there has not been much need to diversify. I think Nigeria is dependent on oil because of the demand of oil from the countries in the world. The money oil alone brings, if you go to the other state right now, the bunker money is a lot. In fact, there is the whole militant situation of, about oil. It's, 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 how do you, how do you call it again? It's black gold. We have agri agriculture, we have human resources, we have sports and entertainment. When they drill out this oil, they flare out the gases, right? And I know that gas thing is like some serious, serious money. They, they just waste it. We can like make something out of it. It's a billion dollar industry, if I'm not mistaken. If we can leave the idea of oil, then move on to the marine sector, coupling with the idea of marine transportation and also conservation, then it's a big hit for us. If the government would only invest in these people, leave this oil and white collar job roads, we would find a whole lot of ways to boom the economy. At least if you look at um, oil, it's a big money for so many people. So virtually everybody is focused on that huge national kick. So nobody's looking out to diversify. We explore how some Nigerians are working towards breaking the oil dependency cycle by diversifying the economy, investing in other sectors, and promoting environmental conservation. And today we are talking about the twins, Nigeria oil. Can we actually separate these two or actually make them work better? We are going to have a conversation that doesn't really include a lot of institutions today because those, that conversation around oil can be quite testy, especially since we want to talk about it in an innovative way to apply imagination, particularly for a young um, audience, as to what exactly needs to change and how can they go about doing that. I've got somebody who is eminently qualified to do that with me. Mr. Inka Ogunubi is a finance professional with 
extensive experience in corporate treasury and finance spanning over 20 years. He's an expert in the implementation of the treasury management system across Africa, being that he was one of the pioneers himself. I mean, he started from Nigeria, uh, from the Nigerian banks, and has been implemented across Africa. He's also a, an author and wrote a book titled, Honey, Is It in the Budget? He's the president of the Association of Corporate Treasurers of Nigeria. Mr. Inka Ogunobi, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure having me. I haven't got my hands on your book yet, but I want it. You'll get one. The first thing I'm going to ask is, why has Nigeria continued to be addicted to oil? It is an addiction, isn't it? It is. It is an addiction. And I think it's a very good question as well. Uh, by the way, thanks for having me. Um, Nigeria started this journey, as you, as you st uh, said, uh, many years ago. And we thought that oil was just going to be one of the additions to uh, our many uh, sectors. But over time, when we saw the ease to which we were making uh, the money and the income, we, uh, we got addicted to it because it was easy money that flowed in. And so Nigeria became, um, we became embroiled in this rent economy that it was easy to sit down in Abuja and uh, wait at the end of the month for FAAC meetings and just share the money. And, and that made everybody happy. Um, there were agitations from the South-South. And then what did you, how did we start to settle that? We just gave them derivation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, 13%. Mm -hmm. And with that, we became very dependent upon that income. And we stopped developing other sectors of the economy to the detriment of, uh, of, of, of the country. And, and, and that's why we're here today. Break down to them how it works. Mm. You know, how it works right now in terms of what, who gets money, what they do with it. Because when people hear things like IGR, it's, you know, it's just numbers, it's just acronyms to them. You know, I'm not saying everyone, yeah. but generally. So that yeah. people understand how that really works. Yeah. You know, and what could have been. Okay. All right, good. So it's important to know that Nigeria is a federation, mm -hmm. all right? And in the federation, you have the federal government, you have subnationals. Mm -hmm. Subnationals are state governments. And then you then have the local government. Now, the, the Nigerian constitution, the revenue of Nigeria is shared along these three um, um, partners, mm -hmm. really, in the federation. So we have what we call the revenue sharing formula. So all revenue is paid into the federation account. Okay? And um, by a revenue sharing formula, which, by the way, is not in the Constitution, because there's, there's no law, really, saying that this is the formula. It's actually, uh, the current formula we're using now is by an executive order uh, signed by, I believe, Obasanjo. Obasanjo, I remember. Yeah, so, so there's a formula that says when the income comes into the Federation account, you give the federal government this portion, you give the state government that portion, and you give the local government that portion. So the federal government takes somewhere in the... Technically, it takes about 50% of it, but it takes less when you factor in uh, a derivation. The state government takes somewhere in the neighborhood of another uh, huge chunk of that, and then local government gets that. So the income is shared. So essentially, when you hear that Nigeria made, um, let's, let, let me give a figure. Let's say we made 10 trillion um, naira from um, taxes. It's not like 10 trillion came to the federal government. The federal government is just going to take about half of that. The rest is going to the states. There are other taxes that the government collects. VAT, for instance. VAT is shared 85% to states and local government. Mm -hmm. The federal government takes only 15%. Mm -hmm. So understand that when you hear revenue, it's not everything that is going to the, mm -hmm. to the, to the federal government. Mm -hmm. Um, a large chunk of it is actually going to the states, mm -hmm. which is why when we have these conversations about revenue sharing, we should not just focus only on the federal government. We should also look at what the states are doing mm -hmm. because they are taking a large chunk of that revenue. Is it that we don't make enough or that what we make, we don't even apply it properly? It, it's, it's, it's both. 
Number one, we don't make enough. Nigeria has a revenue problem, a big revenue problem. And I'll give, I'll give you figures. Uh, today, the 2023 budget is 21 point something trillion that the federal government says we want to spend, okay, on recurring expenditure, on capital expenditure, on other things. Now, in that budget, the amount we plan to receive in revenue, to get from revenue from the federal um, uh, federation account uh, for the federal government is about 10 trillion. All right? So half of the amount we said we're going to spend is actually what we're going to earn in income. So we don't have enough so to be able to fund. So we want to, to fund... spend more than, because I, I want, to, I want yes. to say it in language that people understand. So we have... We want our budget said we want to, we need to spend twenty one. We need to spend twenty one trillion. Or twenty one trillion. Yes. We can only right now make ten trillion. Ten trillion, yes. So the shortfall eleven trillion. We borrow. We borrow it. Do you understand? Because that means somebody has to pay it. You guys will pay it. Yeah, it's true. You uh, guys there's will what we pay call it. per capita debt. Mm -hmm. Um so for the debt Nigeria owes. And, and when I say Nigeria owes, I don't mean just the federal government. I mean the state government, the local government as well, um, is supposed to be paid technically by every citizen of the country. So you earn, so essentially, when you divide the debt by the population of Nigeria, the portion you know, <laughs> that comes to, to you is what, is what you owe yeah. uh, te technically. So Nigeria plans to earn 10 trillion Naira this year, but it plans to spend twice that. So the question is, where is it going to get the money from? It's going to borrow that money. Yeah. Secondly, the one that we have, the 10 trillion that we have, okay, and technically we don't really have that 10 trillion. We just budget to have it. But the 10 trillion we say we will have, we are spending a good chunk of it on things we're not supposed to spend, okay? And that brings up the whole subsidy conversation. We're spending about four trillion of that subsidizing fuel. Mm. So every time you drive your car into a filling station, and then you buy your fuel for 180 something naira per liter, understand that the federal government is literally giving you money because that fuel costs a lot more, close to a, almost 500 naira mm. per liter. Mm. So every time you buy 100 and something naira per liter, the federal government is literally giving you about 400 naira extra because it is paying for it in subsidies. Yeah. So two things, we don't earn enough and the one we earn, we're not spending it the way we should. It's, it's, a, it's a little embarrassing. Why is it so difficult for us to earn? It's an interesting question and I think that it, it brings to for the responsibility of the Nigerian to fund the government. Now, in most developed economies, government is funded through tax revenue. And that's why it brings us to the addiction to oil. Because Nigerians got, Nigeria got addicted to oil, we focus less on tax, tax revenue. Because, I mean, sell a barrel of oil for $100, $100 and then you're fine. And then you can, you can just go out every month to Abuja and collect the money. Mm -hmm. And so we focus less on developing our ability to collect revenue through taxation. Most developed countries in the world run government through taxation. In fact, the World Bank says that the minimum, the minimum um, standard for any country is that your tax to GDP mm -hmm. ratio must be 15%. Mm -hmm. In Nigeria, it's 6%. Mm -hmm. Ghana, is about 13%. So you can understand that we're, we're, we're not collecting enough taxes. Yeah. And the reaction of the average Nigeria would be, tax, where, how? You're mm -hmm. going to tax us more? No, 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 that's not the issue. It's not about taxing more. It's about how many people are actually paying taxes. Mm -hmm. And so the issue really is that there must be robust tax reforms, not to tax more Nigerians, because if you tax more Nigerians, it only means that the few people that are you know, paying the tax are mm -hmm. going to be taxed more. Mm -hmm. But to expand the tax bracket. The fact is this. If we are going to run the economy of this country, we need to increase the collection of tax, of tax by the FIRS 
and other, other institutions. In my own view, to be able to get to that 15% tax to GDP ratio, the FIRS plus Nigeria Customs have to, have to rake in something in the neighborhood of 30 trillion in revenue. And if the revenue from, the, uh, from taxation comes in, mm -hmm. we will not depend on oil. So now the issue is, and it goes back even to the issue around subsidy as understood first and foremost by maybe like activists, because they do understand that the subsidy itself is fraudulent. Aside from the economic arguments and all the structural issues, there are some fraudulent, corrupt practices you know, in the back end of that. So if we talk about expanding the taxation base of a country, yes. People will say to you that all oh, the average person here says that you're going to tax the poorer even more rather than yes. the companies or the yes. individuals that have more money. And more than anything else, should the conversation not be first making it possible for people to earn more, i.e. the economic base of the country itself becomes much more robust. How am I going to tax somebody who doesn't have any way? Do you know what I mean? Sure. So, it would seem that isn't the conversation rather than, and, I, and it seems that yes, nobody can argue with the need to tax more, but what are we taxing? Where are the companies? Where are, if there are no companies, who's going to employ the people? You know, where is the industrial enterprise and manufacturing base that Nigeria is going to tax people on? Which takes us okay. back to the issue of shouldn't oil have been used to develop exactly. that? Exactly. So it's, it's a case of which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Uh -huh. We can really do both. And I want to say that, that yes, I agree that there are, uh, there are a lot of companies that are struggling. But I can tell you that there are loads of people, loads of companies, loads of businesses in Nigeria today that are making a kill and they are paying zero taxes. Because there are landlords in Lagos here who charge their rent in dollars and they pay zero tax, zero personal income tax, and even zero capital gains tax. So I am not talking about taxing the already overtaxed Nigerian. I'm talking about improve the system, formalize the system in such a way to capture those who are not paying their fair share. But my brother, we were getting money before before now from oil, 30 trillion we get before, in the days of oil boom and all of that, what thing we take and do? How do we know that this 30 trillion, should it come into this pocket, will not miraculously disappear again? And we still won't have the economic base of infrastructure that people need to be able to earn more. But guess what? There's no more only money from oil. Yeah. In the budget of 2023, we plan to, 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 to get about 1.9 trillion from oil what we intend to get from other sources of, of, uh, of uh, revenue is more. So today, in the, today's Nigeria's reality is that we're earning less from oil than we used to. Mm -hmm. And so, so the reality now is that the Nigerian government needs your money. They need the money, they need money from CIT, uh, company income tax. They need the money from capital gains. They need it coming from all these monies they needed. And because we are the ones literally going to supply this money or this income, we have a voice. And with that voice, we can make demands and we can insist that the country be accountable or the government be accountable to us. If you don't pay your taxes, whether it is from a corporate angle or from a personal angle, you really don't have a basis to ask questions. So what I hear you say is that if we were to use the analogy of drug use or drug addiction, is that the drug is run out or almost out. Yes. And it means we are going to hit withdrawal syndrome. Or perhaps we have already hit the withdrawal syndrome. Okay. Let's think about that whilst we go on this break. Just phone call today, AJ. Are you there to leave a secret? This was another lifetime. Before I met you, Ada, 
It's all lies. Isn't it, Adrian? There's some truth in it. If your personal life is affecting your work and your colleagues. If I had told you about my past, you never would have given me a chance. That is not a decision for you to make. It's good you came. You see, the Holy Spirit spoke to me about you. I remember you. We go way back. <laughs> Why are you doing this to us? I gave you everything. This is a sin. You're a coward. <laughs> Get out! Sooner or later, something must kill a man. Conversation we already started has now been joined by two other people whom I'm really pleased to introduce. I'll start with the lady. She's come all the way from Enugu and she is Mrs. Ijoma Eziaso. So Mrs. Ijoma Eziaso is a business, trade and policy analyst. She has vast knowledge in industrial and economic policy. She has a multidisciplinary background spanning accounting, finance, development studies, sustainable human development, environmental management, and strategic management. Right beside her is somebody who I would say can take you from where you are to where you could be. Mr. Abiodun Dominic Odunoga is an international business development consultant for clients who want to expand or introduce their products and services across borders to new markets in Europe or across Africa. He works in initiatives that include the French and other European st stakeholders that are focused on growing or helping African startups and SME, small, medium um, enterprises. Let me put it in the street language. It can help your business, Japa. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people are always talk about they, Japa. Really, yeah. your business should Japa because then you are making real money. Thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Thank you. All right. Before we went on the break, we had come to a point where we realized that, look, it might be that we are already in withdrawal. You know, if we are talking about oil as an addiction to Nigeria, we are in, in withdrawal because of the state of the economy. Let me take it from you, Ijoma. At this point, what can make a difference? In no nonsense language, in, no, in crisis, let's solve the problem we are in mode. What can make a difference? Fumi, first of all, I want to thank you for bringing up this topic now. Actually, you're providing expo for the incoming government. It is no longer business as usual. We have to be strategic. All levels of government, federal, state, local government, the party is over. We should all realize that. There is no part in. In, able, in, in getting out of the, the mess we are right now, we have to be very, very strategic. We can no longer work in silos. For us to get out of this mess, everybody needs to be to, in the same room, on the same page. The Central Bank, the Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Transport. Everybody, the state government, the local government, all have to sit in the same room and understand the problem where we are leaving oil, the cheaper way of sharing money, to go heading into innovation. We can no longer make money as easy as we used to. The policy has to be in tandem with our reality. We can't have local government chairmen thinking that they are not part of the export value chain. Where you have to move a mango or a yam from Bainway to a Papa port or to Portacot port. And the local government chairman wants to collect IGR that is, doesn't even come formally into the, into the pockets of government. Because when we say Nigerian, the Nigerians don't pay tax, coming from the manufacturing background, I smile. Because we pay lots of taxes that are not captured. There is a lot going on on the road. By the time a goods moves from Benue to a Papa, it's there is no way you can compete. So for us to get to that innovative path that we will now transcend oil and begin to 
add value to other things that will earn money for Nigeria, a lot has to be discussed. Right. For me, you are actually exporting public eye. Hmm. Any person watching this program outside Nigeria, if you're doing collaboration with all the other big networks, international networks, you're already an exporter. Hmm. And I believe that the policy should also make you, it easier for you to export. Absolutely. Since I came in here, I've been hearing the, the generator on. Mm -hmm. Because I work in industry, my heart has been beating on your behalf. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because hearing that generator, once that thing is going on for every industrialist, you are dying silently. Mm -hmm. So for me, this is a refinery. Mm -hmm. This is Nigeria's refinery. Mm -hmm. You have an export product and you are on generator, mm -hmm. gulping diesel. Mm -hmm. How much? So, Mr. Piodo, how are we able to export what we can't make oh. or even export competitively? Oh. Very, very good question. I, I think Ijama already set um, a very good tone for that conversation. Um, and the first actually has to start from the policy level. Um, we all need to wake up, and I'm also trying to use this opportunity to speak to the new or incoming administration. Uh, if we can't build prosperity right now the track of oil. And we've done it for many years. This oil has brought over 160 million Nigerians into multidimensional poverty. And it tells us, I mean, the facts are there, staring us in the face. If, as of 2020, if, you, if we're exporting oil, I mean, we're producing oil, I think we're producing about 1.8 million barrels mm -hmm. per day. So if you calculate that and you give each Nigerian a barrel, that means in a year, you have entitled to about 3.3 barrels. I don't know how that can make us rich or that can make us get out of poverty. And so when we come back home, the question right now is, what do we do? And I mean, talking about the oil, for me, the oil conversation also seems to be um, a question about somebody who is trying to buy expired eggs mm. and planning to take a seven days journey to meet his, his or her clients. And by the time he gets there, the eggs are already expired. Mm. We're supplying all to our bigger, biggest clients, the US, China, Spain, Netherlands, India. These five countries and many of them across the world already have a plan that between 2030 and 2050, they're going to cut their carbon emission Absolutely. and have carbon neutrality. So we're talking about right the next 15 years, what's the plan? We're still focusing on something that does not have exportation value anymore. I mean, beyond production, beyond all of these things, and that's why she was talking about innovation. Mm -hmm. I mean, so then we celebrate the likes of India. India also had that terrible um, experience in the past, but it is something right, which was to look inwards and tap into the BPO, you know, when it comes to um, exporting their services. Now today, India has been able to lift 90 million people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. Today, when you pick a call, and probably you're taking Air France or taking American Airways, and you may probably misplace your baggage in Paris, you think you're calling an American mm -hmm. airline or a French airline. Your caller or the person who is your customer care representative is in Mumbai telling you, hello, where did you misplace your bag? Say in Paris, this terminal. She's giving you precise solution to your problem, seated in Mumbai in India. And India has been able to build a whole holistic ecosystem around service provision. Nigeria has young people. We're not deficient of youthful demography. As a matter of fact, Europe right now is suffering from that. Mm -hmm. Aged population that can't do nothing. That's why they give us scholarships. That's why they give us passports. They call it passport talent to be able to take our young people. We don't even need to be able to export anything. We can export our brain. The brain is mm -hmm. the capital. Our young people are innovative. I tell my colleagues, um, the young people I mentor in Nigeria, it's even easier for you to stay back here and end Forex than coming to Europe and you're paying so much tax and you're just living and surviving. Mm -hmm. But what the question should be today is how do we be able to governize resources to be able to ensure that we mainstream our youth, their brain power, to be able to attract Forex. While I was excited at what they were saying, I was looking at our government and I'm asking myself, what are they bringing to the table? Mm. These guys will go there, solve an European problem, and remain there. And we're not even talking about remittance. And when they mm -hmm. send back money home, you probably would have assumed they would send money back as investment. It's for Ashwabi and mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Generator. Mm -hmm. They don't even, there's no diaspora investment conversation we're having. Yeah. So it's, it's not even saying don't travel out. I'm saying even those who are there, I'm, I'm a part of the diaspora. 
and I know how much resource that just diaspora has. Mm -hmm. Ireland builds their country on diaspora. The same with China, Jewish culture, all of these people. We've not even tapped into 1% of what diaspora has in terms of brain power, in terms of also financial capital. Right. And all of these conversations, I think the new administration should begin to look at. Right. Lady and gentlemen, they usually say never waste a crisis because crises are also opportunity. We've already identified that Nigeria has hit withdrawal syndromes. We're at crisis point. This is not the first time, by the way. Yeah. It happened in the 80s. It happened in the 90s. Every time that happens, there's a wave of jackpot. Every time there's a jackpot wave in Nigeria, look at the economy. What usually turns it around is that there's a change. Maybe there's some war somewhere or something. The global oil prices go up, mm -hmm. so Nigeria gets a new lease of life. What are we looking at if it doesn't change? Mm -hmm. I think we have to be honest with ourselves. It's a long-term goal. Our biggest export right now is human capital. Our biggest export right now is our people. And, and I think that that's where we ought to invest. You know, so so we say human capital, where is it going to come from? But you see, India, one of the biggest exports of human capital in the world, uh, focused on, in, on that sector because it became one of the you know, best ways or biggest ways for them to get back to repatriate uh, uh, you know, uh, foreign currency mm -hmm. into the country. Mm -hmm. And Nigerians today, so when I see Nigerians jack bar going, it's, for me, it's, a, it's an opportunity. The question is, how are we trying to maximize that opportunity? How are we trying to help them to ensure that you know, they're able to settle and, and, and do some of these things easy? How are we investing in them? I'll give you an example. I mean, I have a daughter who has been you know, in the news for, for a while. I mean, she, she created an app you know, many years ago. And um, as a 12-year-old girl, is that your, why didn't, it didn't, it didn't click. You are, the, you are the dad of a genius. I yeah, saw the yeah, story. Yeah, to me, see. I mean, she, she, created, she created the app uh, as a 12-year-old girl. Um, and she created it because we as our parents, we didn't allow her to go out. So she felt that, okay, if I do this app and all that, and then they can monitor me wherever I am, you know, they can allow me to go, you know. And, and that was it. And cut the long story short, the BBC found out about the story. Right? And the BBC wrote to us to say, they want to do a documentary about this girl. So they came around. They followed her for a couple of weeks and all that. They went to her school. They asked her to recreate the app. They wanted to be sure what she was saying was true. It wasn't something or a fable or whatever. She did. They went to the marketplace, tested it. And when they saw that it worked, they did a documentary, a three-minute documentary on her, which was, which was okay. Now, immediately they did the, the, the documentary, we started getting from all over the world, um, from the UK, from, from um, Germany, from the US, institutions giving us scholarship, saying, come over, come over, we're going to give you a scholarship. You know, it got to the point that I, as a father, I wanted her to study in Nigeria, you know, I, I was patriotic, I wanted her to, but after a while I realized that I was going to just be holding this girl back. Mm. So we looked at it and we said, okay, fine, let's, uh, let's, let's pick one. And we, we, we picked uh, 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 an international school somewhere in Germany that gave her scholarship worth 40,000 euros. This is a girl that is still in high school that has not achieved anything, you know, beyond just, you know. And then from there, she got, you know, uh, today she, 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 she was one of the first recipients of the Eric Smith. Um, Rice Award, uh, you know, which basically um, has given her scholarship through school, but also has decided to say, the day she says, I have an idea and I want to go into um, tech or whatever, they have a seed funding of about $5 million waiting for her. That's an investment people. by people <laughs> who don't know her. Now, when she was in Nigeria, and I said, you know, look, uh, uh, Tommy Singh, let's have Nigerian institutions. Let's show them what you've done. We actually wrote, I mean, I'm a, I'm a good treasurer, so I mean, I have a relationship with banks. I helped her. I gave her the names of the banks. I've gathered. We wrote to all the banks in Nigeria to say, this is what this girl is doing. This is what she wants to do. Can you invest in our education? Hmm. Guess what? Only one of them wrote back. 
you know, and give her something. You know, I, I thank them anyway. But what I'm trying to say is, is the government, the private institutions, are not ready to invest in our human capital. We are at a crisis point. Oh. It looks like it's the kind of crisis that we cannot avoid yeah. the way that we did before. What might change this trajectory for us? Because if something were to change it, there's also the, 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 the possibilities are incredible. Yeah. yeah. If something were to change it for good. Yeah. Th thank you very much. Um, I'll just keep it maybe at three, three major solutions I, I, I think um, we can begin to take. Number one is agriculture. Um, agriculture. I mean, we know it's already the potential, but I don't think we've, we've really delved, delved into what it means in terms of export potential. Mm -hmm. In France, um, I know I many of us know Champagne. We all know Champagne. Champagne is produced in a city in France called Champagne. Mm -hmm. So if you take Champagne and it's not from that Champagne city or village in France, it's a fake Champagne. What the EU and France have done is to do something called geographical indication, where they've endorsed a particular commodity of a small city and made it global. So whether in the US or whether in Iraq or whether in Turkey, if you take a champagne and it's not from that city, it's a fake champagne. So now, imagine what that village is doing when it comes to contributing to the GDP and the economic prowess of that city. Now, Nigeria has so many cities and states with good products. The only problem we've had is that most of our products are not even, they don't have exportable value as much. Most of our commodities, we only contribute maybe 1% in terms of export. And that export, I will tell you something. If you go to a shop in Europe or you go to a wholesaler in Dubai, you see Nigerian cashew nuts, mm. Nigerian granuts, sheer butter. But when you see it, you see, from, I'm giving you a very particular example. This Gary flower, cassava flower is from Mama Shegun in Lagos. Somewhere small, but rebranded and repackaged by a Lebanese or Chinese or an Indian company. So what they've done is they come here, take our raw put, the same problem with the crude oil. Where we sell the crude, we import back what is refined. So they buy it, the raw cashew, and they sort of had more finishing touches to it, and they make it exportable. And that cannot be done at our individual level. I'm saying that's where the government comes in. Where the government is saying, what is Quara State good at? Is this yam? Can we give this yam and put our weight behind the state where this yam becomes a very good yam that if you take it in Paris, you take it in Romania, it's from this state. That state doesn't need any other allocation from crude oil if they get it right. That's why when you go to Starbucks, whether in the US or most countries, you see sometimes on the label, this is produced by a local farmer in Mexico. Imagine what that farmer planting coffee is earning. And that's because they've been able to get what is called geographical engagement rights where they can tell that this is quality and the government has brought some level of structuring. We don't have that. And that's why our exploitation when it comes to agriculture is still very fallow. The other part where Ijeoma talked about is education. Today, I don't, I have, I've not been able to do a due diligence, but what, what, when somebody is learning mass communication, I want to assume that mass comm today has social media in it. I want to assume that mass comm today has things around SE optimization. Because it's mass comm that my grandma and our grandparents studied. We are looking for the traditional NTA, you know, with all due respect, to work and doesn't have all this touch of present day reality, then it's a waste of time. The curriculum has to be adapted. There's no point studying something unrelated that doesn't have any commercial value. Mm -hmm. The world currently has problem with renewable energy. The world is talking about things around, you know, IT, blockchain. I want to assume that people who are studying Java or computer science are studying what once they come out, they don't even need to work for a Nigerian company. I can tell you how many young people, like you mentioned, are here but they are servicing global companies mm -hmm. without having to leave the shores. Mm -hmm. But that also comes to education from us using the backward integration. What does the word mean today? Scrap all courses that doesn't make it, that doesn't make sense. And go back and ask ourselves, when somebody studies this course, 
what problem are they solving currently? Exactly. My final project in class, and so, like some of you, is on the shelves. It has no business. It was just to get AD and 5.0 GP if you are lucky. And that's why, but that's not what people out there are doing. Our competitors out there, the young people out there, are solving everyday problems. In Europe, they have even um, pathways where somebody can study and at the same time be working. It's called autonomous, where what you are studying, you have to now practice it today. You, have, you don't have to wait for after your grades and say, oh, I'm useless. So you are knowing what is happening in both worlds. And the last one, I just remembered one right now before I drop, is creative industry. Mm -hmm. And creative industry is, is a norm. As a matter of fact, the creative industry currently employs over 4 million people, more than even the petrol industry or the oil industry. Right. And inside creative industry, that's where you have Nollywood. Mm -hmm. Nigeria is probably number two, number three biggest film, mode, as like some of you know. Mm -hmm. We have music, which you understand, but... The other areas that we don't talk about, which is, she's talking about sport management, that's one. There's animation. There's so much. Gaming. <laughs> Gaming. And there's no reason why NTA is the way it still is. Because <laughs> when I hear, when you said carcasses, that's, I will come back to it again. One of the things that I'm really interested in is, I really am I'm looking forward to a generation or a people who have enough courage to take what is and break it and, and change it. There's no, we, we cannot go around in circles. We cannot go around in circles because actually I've, been, I've mediated so many conversations, including with people who were at one point just protesting the same thing and then I've had the power to change it. I know that there has to be a point where we'll get the people with the courage and it is political courage to do what needs to to be done, and that is my own challenge because I hear you, as I listen to everything, we've gone over many things in the time we've been together. What I see immediately is, it just needs somebody that goes, oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 or like, oh yeah, 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 and that oh yeah is, I don't want to hear. I've always talked about a tear pant generation. You know, tear pant does not mean tear pant, it's like, I'm talking about courage, like, we don't, we don't have a choice and we are doing it because crisis is here. We cannot waste it again, you know? So I'm going to take a break and kind of mediate a conversation between you and younger people and see if we can take it from what we know, not only what we know that has happened, what we know that is possible. We've already said what is possible, but where belief comes in. That is what we don't know. What we don't know is those who will have the courage to do it. Right after the break. <laughs> Just phone call today, AJ. Are you there to leave a secret? This was another lifetime. Before I met you, Ada. It's all lies. Isn't it, AJ? There's some truth in it. If your personal life is affecting your work and your colleagues. If I had told you about my past, you never would have given me a chance. That is not a decision for you to make. It's good you came. You see, the Holy Spirit spoke to me about you. I remember you. We go way back. <laughs> Why are you doing this to us? I gave you everything. This is a sin. You're a coward. <laughs> Get out! Sooner or later, something must kill a man. And our conversation today is on Nigeria and oil. The past, the present, the future. We've clearly identified that Nigeria has to come out of our oil addiction. And in fact, we are in withdrawal. We've talked about what is possible. We now want to talk about how. How do we go from what we know to what we have to do? What is the belief system that will bring it about? And who 
are the people or the generation that will bear the, ca uh, the cards. Uh, one of my panelists has left, you know, is handed over to those who would answer the questions on his behalf also. And we are going to take conversations and questions and comments from a much younger set of people, you know, and see what they, you know, what they are going to be able to do. So hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're ready to roll. OK, good. Good day, everyone. So basically, everyone is talking about elevating poverty. And basically, there are like two class of people in Nigeria. That's the rich people and like, let's say three class, huh? the poor people, the people that are in between, like the middle class, then the high class. So basically, I feel like these rich people, they are like privileged. The difference between the rich people and the poor people are the opportunities that they have, like that the poor people don't have, what God has given them. And people used to say something that like, your money is not for you. It's not for only you. It's for others to be able to have privilege. So I feel like there's a, if there's a way that government can do something like, like a organization that these rich people can donate something and give privilege to the less opportune people. Because these people are the set of people that waste money on parties, on clothes that are too expensive, things that are unnecessary. But why can't they give out to people that are less privileged? So what do you think the government can do to help people that are less privileged to gain something from the people that are more privileged? And what do you think the people that are more privileged can do? Because some people have this money, they don't know where to start from to give to people because they are scared of being scammed from. Because if you go to orphanage homes now, people you drop the money with, the organizers there can keep the money and not share. So a lot of people are scared of going out to give out to people because they don't want to be scammed. So what do you think governments and also people can do to give out to the less privileged? Baby girl, thank you for that question. It also brings it a clearer vision of what the young people are thinking. Um, there are opportunities everywhere, both for the rich, the middle class, and the poor. Let me give you an example. I come from the East where we celebrate funerals. We call it funeral economy. It's actually the people that were left behind in the village who make so much money from anybody that dies anywhere in the world. From the band boys to the mortuary attendants to everything, to the cooking and everything, it boils down to people within that community making the best out of it. The so-called percentage of the super rich in Nigeria is not as much as we make it sound. It is not an accident, it is called the 1% everywhere in the world. Yeah. It's, an, it's, a, it's a small percent. All the other people, they are just, I don't know the street language for it, everybody's just making it look like that. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing, yes, they are just faking it until they make it too. And then, finally, is that you must be very careful of anything that takes individual power from you. You must be very careful because you are dependent now on another human being's goodwill. What if they don't have it? What if they can't have it? You know, are you not in charge of yourself? And poverty is not an identity. It's a situation. It's a situation. It, is not, it is not an identity. Nobody, nobody's identity is to be poor. It is just a situation that can change at any time. Um, from all that has been said today, um, I believe and I can say that we know the problem. We are able to identify the problem and we know what solution to provide to this problem. But the thing is, I would say the issue we are having is um, that courage and ability to profess, uh, to bring in the solutions to this program is maybe, I would say I was scared to do this thing or say this thing because I believe um, at every level of government, there are people who are ready to pull the plug if things doesn't go their own way. And one of the basic problems I see in this generation is that we are all misinformed. We don't know what is happening. Even if we know what is happening, we all form negligence to it. We go online, we don't know the right thing to search for. We are all going, you know, if it's not TikTok, if it's not Instagram, we don't know the right 
no channel to go into. So and with that, so many informations and so many things are passing us by by the day. So I would like to know, and if there are, um, how would I say this? I would like to know if there are, can somebody please help me? Um, yes, no, like if there are, no, if there are like channels that are open to with the young ones to access this information, this um, grant or something that are open that we can all benefit from. I don't know if there's anything like that from mm -hmm. the government. Let, let me just say something quickly to the young lady. The, the biggest, the difference between the rich and the poor is the idea, that's all. Uh, create value, find somebody that will buy it, you've exchanged it for money. Uh, I'll give you an example, Ikorodu boys. Who, who has heard about them? Mm, everyone. Ikorodu boys, I mean, boys in the slum, they are international, internationally global, why? By mimicking what they see on, on TV. So you can create value, create content, and then monetize it. It's easy, it's not a problem. So let me speak to the question about, you know, I think the question that the young guy asks mm. about amending the law. So that young people. So that young people. Um, the, the first thing is, have we even maximized the law itself? The young, not too young uh, to run law, all right? If you look at the current, um, the last election, one of the questions I posed to you know, sort of my friends in, uh, in Yaga, that, that's, that's their name, is, is that, have we made progress? How many young people actually took advantage of that opportunity? At the level to which the law is, the, the age bracket is right now. We're not even taking advantage of that. We want to lower the threshold so that the younger people will come. It's not about how young you are that makes governance better. It's really about how prepared you are for that task. And that's why I will go into the next, um, the, the gentleman's question. The first thing we need to do is educate ourselves. And one of the biggest challenges I have with young people in Nigeria today is that we're not educated. We're educated academically, but we're not educated about governance. And so when you, you, you hear it a lot in, in how we talk about governance, that we're not, we don't even know about the things like the, what's on the concurrent list. If I ask you what's on the concurrent list of the, of the, of the National Assembly, you don't know what's on an exclusive list. And if you don't know, I, I, I was talking, who was I talking to? It was you. We we're talking about the Business Facilitation Act mm -hmm. that was signed into law just this February during the election campaign. The Business Facilitation Act is a, is a signed law that allows for um, businesses, importers, exporters, anybody that wants to do business to have a single window of documentation regarding their business. It's supposed to make everything simple. Well, talking about time, we have come to the end of the show. I know that it's very important, the issue about embezzlement and scam and all of that. But one of the things I've said that I would like to repeat here is that it is possible for innovation to outrun corruption, of course. And if you don't go for that, you might not succeed ever. Once upon a time, armed robbery was much more prevalent. Yeah. Armed robbery is not as, it's not because people don't want to do armed robbery. Why are you going to bother with armed robbery now? You know, because it has become a bit obsolete in some places. You're not gonna get anything in anybody's house because technology, opportunities, all kinds of things, it's not like it's not, it's not happening, but it doesn't happen as much as it should. It is possible that so many of the things we take for granted that people are doing now, it will become low value. So there will be other things that are higher value that they can redirect their energy towards. For me, part of the challenge to a new set of leadership yeah. is how innovation can outrun corruption. corruption. Because I'm not really a believer in people doing, act, acting in their own best interest, mm -hmm. always. Sometimes people do things because it is the best, it is the wisest thing to do at that time. I th let me rephrase it. I don't think people will always say, let's depend on people's goodwill, that's it. You know, or sense. let us encourage people, let the right thing become the better thing to do in that way. I don't know if I made any sense, but yeah. that's where I'm going to leave it. I thank you all for being so engaged. I wish you all well. I'm always praying for a generation, you know, ahead of us or in front of us, next to us, to do those things that we couldn't even do. Thank you very much, Inka. Thank you. you know, I give my, my love to your daughter. 
I will take a picture and send to her. Yes, and please <laughs> tell her that somebody really admires her. My sister, we should meet in Enugu. Thank you. You're right? welcome to Enugu, the best city in the world. The best city in the world. All right, that's the show for the day. Thank you for watching. Thank we'll you. be back another time with another topic. Join us then. Bye-bye.